Mm -hmm. My question is, what methodology would you employ to promote collectivism in the black community? Especially since you stated that uh, black individuals are sometimes selfish. So what, can you answer that question for me? Sure. Thank you, Nasheed. Um, not only sometimes selfish, we're most of the time selfish, and I would argue that not only are we stealing from our community, but we're stealing from our descendants. When we go out and shop, we're not considering our grandkids, great-great-grandkids, or great-great-grandchildren. We have a very limited view of existence. The average black person is concerned about his life and his life only. But when you look at other cultural groups, they plan 50 to 100 years down the road. They want to make sure that their great-grandkids, great-grandkids, don't have to go to another people for a job. A lot of this is through conditioning, through the dominant society and the black church as well, that has made us ignore the role of culture and ethnic identity in everything, from politics to economics to your spending habits. When we talk about changing, you said a method of to change, you have to change the value system upon which black America operates. Why do we spend $120 on a pair of Air Jordans? We value Air Jordan. Why do we spend $500 on a Louis Vuitton bag? We value white people's names on our bodies. So before you can change how we do what we do, you got to change what we do what we do. You have to replace the value system of black folk. We, do, we value European materialism, and we value outdoing other black folk. Will Smith said what? Black people spend too much money they do not have to buy things they cannot afford to impress people they don't even like. Do you realize how much of our economic behavior is motivated to look better than the next African? We will go into debt just to look better than the next African. So our debt is motivated by self-hate. You have to change the value system. A Chinese man, an East Indian, an Arab, whoever you name, they can have a store right next to your restaurant. Okay, it could be a blizzard outside. They're hungry. There's a black restaurant next door. There's an Italian pizzeria right there. There's a, a East Indian restaurant. The closest Chinese restaurant, 10 miles away. He's starving. But guess what? Because he values cultural commitment, he will starve until after work and take that 10 mile trip to that Chinese restaurant on the other side of the town because he values keeping his dollar amongst his own people. You have to change the values upon which black people operate because we do not value each other. And until we value each other, we will continue to be loyal to everyone but ourselves. Remember, it is the shared cultural experience of the Chinese the Arab, the East Indian, the Anglo-Saxon, the Native American, the Latino, the European Jew, that motivates them to want to do for self. It is that history, that identity, that ethnicity that makes me proud, that makes me want to build my own school, my own hospital, my own supermarket, my own distribution company, but for black folk, because we were taught to hate it, and because they replaced our culture with religion, we do not identify primarily as what we are. We identify with who we believe. So for us, it's okay to buy from the white folk as long as he's Christian. It's okay to buy from the Arab as long as he's a Muslim, you see? So we changed our priority when they took away our ethnicity. And the only way you're going to fix it is put the ethnicity back. Your blackness... Your Africanity, your shared African history and culture must be the foundation upon which everything else is built. If it is not, it will crumble because a house built on a weak foundation will fail and you cannot resurrect black folks on religion. Give them their culture. <clears throat> Thank you, Brother Nashi, for the great question. Yes, sister. Um, hi, my name is Jalen Turner. And um, my question was similar to his. You kind of already answered it. But my question is, um, like you say, when you take a power away from a people, from a race, the focus becomes on survival much more than unity. And so most of the time we're in this catch-22. You know, I need, I need, either I need to learn how to survive in a, a white man's world and support my family, or I have to sacrifice and kind of leave my family hanging. So where, like, where is the middle? How do we as black people don't have to choose from two extremes? Wow, that's an excellent Thank question. You, sister. And you're absolutely right. 
because of the war against black people, most of us operate in a desperation survival consciousness. Think about it. If you're preoccupied with survival, you don't plan for your children's future. If you're preoccupied with survival, you don't save money. Save money for what? I may not even be alive in five years. You see, that survival consciousness can only be replaced by us building a community infrastructure that shows black folk that the situation is changing, not because white folk are doing anything differently, but because we are doing something differently. Racism can only affect you to the extent that you are dependent on its institutions for your survival. For example, if black kids had black schools, we wouldn't have to talk about special ed. If black kids had black schools, we wouldn't be talking about expansion in ADHD medication. If black people had their own hospitals like we used to do, you understand? Then guess what? We wouldn't have to talk about the poor health care of black elders or the a ridiculously high infant mortality rate of African women who have one of the largest, highest infant mortality rates in the world, although they live in the most technologically sophisticated country. Black women's infant mortality rate ain't too much better than so-called second and third world nations. But guess what? If we had our own hospital, it wouldn't even be an issue. If we had our own airplanes, we wouldn't have to deal with the racism at the airports. You see, yeah. the problem is we don't have no institutions to serve the needs of our people because our whole civil rights struggle has been about being accepted by other folks. When, when other cultures come here, they don't put together a fight to be accepted by white folk. They say America is all about doing for yourself. You see, so soon when they land, soon when the Chinese get here, soon when the Arab get here, first thing they're looking for is how am I going to be economically independent and self-sustaining so my kids ain't got to go to the white man for a job. First thing the Arab does, lock down five gas stations. <laughs> Chinese, five stop and goes. This is how they operate. European Jews, five banks right off the gate. We're going to be economically self-sustaining. What black folks do? We send our kids to college so they can go and work for white folks. No entrepreneurship, no, no economic independence, and that's what makes most black people inherent sellouts. Because as long as you got to work for white people, you can never tell the truth. You can never do what's right. You're right. You, you understand? You're always worried about that paycheck. You may love your people, you may care, but I can't go hard because I got these bills to pay. They never ended slavery. They modified it. Chain slavery became wage slavery. And most of us are nothing but wage slaves today. Yes. We need our own. And our own don't mean we oppose to nobody. Our own don't mean we hate nobody. The Chinese ain't a racist because he don't let nobody but Chinese work in that store. That's mm -hmm. what he's supposed to do. He's guaranteeing a future for his grandkids. The European Jew ain't a racist because he's not giving you the secrets to how he's controlling the economy. Okay, he's supposed to do that. To guarantee a future for his great grandkids. Black folks are the only folks who will give our secrets away to the world because God knows no color. And then when our kids are broken hungry, we want to go to the same people we gave our secrets away to and beg for some of it back. Stop giving it to them in the first place. Infrastructure do for self. Yes, yes. Excellent question, sister. Sister, please step up. Please step up. Hi, my name is Ashley Skye. Um, I'm, um, I, my question for you is, as a black female, what are the specific, let's say name five things that I can specifically do to help uplift the black male? That I can do every day or every week or specific actions that I can take to help uplift the black male? Thank you, sister. The first would be validating his manhood. And what I mean to say by that is just to affirm and respect who he is. Second, ask him to explain to you, give you his narrative on any issues he may have with black females. Too often, what I see, especially in boys, from their female teachers and females in their life, they're very accusatory, judgmental, and condemnatory. That's what sets that up, you see. Black males are so used to black women running their life that many of them push back against the system with honorable intentions because of what mom did or grandma did or the public school teacher did. So you have to be non-threatening, you have to be non-judgmental and do not compete with the black man. Mm. One of our biggest issues in male-female relationships is black women compete with black men. It only happens in black culture. 
No other culture do the women compete with their men. In black America, the women literally compete with their men. And what I mean by that, not all women, by the way, but what I mean by that is a woman will tell her husband, I make more than you. I got more education than you. I don't need you. There's nothing you can do for me I can't do for myself. You see, they, normally men compete with men. But in the black community, men have to compete with women as well because what they did was they reoriented the system. And this is not the black woman's fault. And men need to understand this. We need to understand. It's not your fault. But they created a system where the black woman does not have to show any respect and does not have to consult or confer with the black male for any decision that she wants to make about herself, her community, or her children. You see that? Every other ethnicity, the woman has to go through the men. We got to have a conversation. Not in black America. Women do what she wants and when she wants to. We're the only culture where the women do not have to respect the male unless they choose to. So I think black women could go a long way to helping the racial situation by holding other black women accountable for how they treat and mistreat their sons and men in their lives. I'll give you a big issue we have that I'm seeing as a psychologist. A lot of women are keeping their kids away from the fathers. Okay? But the men keep getting blamed for not being here. All you hear about is the father's not there. Nobody's talking about why. It's true. You've got some brothers who ain't there because they don't want to be. But that's not the bulk. The bulk are being kept away by the mother who's being supported by her mother. Are y'all following me? And her aunt. So you got a whole family of good Christian black women keeping the kids away from the dad. Or Muslim or whatever. Okay? And nobody doing nothing about it. Black men cannot check black women. Only women can do that. Mm. And many of y'all sitting here got friends with kids who play keep away with the dad. She should not still be your friend. Because you should care so much about the future of the black community that if you're willing to not let your son or daughter be around the father, I can no longer be associated with you. Mm. But how many women turn a blind eye to girlfriends and cousins and aunts and sisters who do wrong by the children as it relates to the father and do nothing about it? Sisters have to hold sisters accountable and brothers have to hold brothers accountable. Right. Great question, sister. We went a long time. We only got a couple questions left. A couple questions, then we have to get out of here. Step up, brother. I'm Mike Lee. I, you touched on what I, what I was concerned about later. Earlier. I recently read a book by Douglas Wilder, son of Virginia. Mm -hmm. And in that book, he made a statement that just blew my mind. He said that black people were able to read and write better in 1880 than they are now. I, I, have a, I have a baby brother who has a PhD in a low educational philosophy. I have another brother who has a PhD in educational psychology. I called them and said, is that true? Because that knocked my side. I can't get over that. I'm having a hard time. I'm struggling with that. And uh, I was speaking to someone about what we should do. I said, we need to have our own black, black school. I said, we don't have black charter schools teach black people. You know, I don't think a white person can really teach you how to deal with this world. Exactly. But I want you touched on it earlier, and I'd like to hear you further comment on it. Uh, certainly. Um, I would agree. But I would say that that was true not only for black folk, that's true for even white folk, that we were better educated and we were much better writers during Reconstruction than we are now. That's because technology has taken us away from the written word. In most schools today, they don't even teach handwriting or cursive anymore. You see that? Why? Because everything is typing, everything is texting, everything is, you know, email. So many school districts have moved away from cursive, moved away from language arts as a formal uh, curriculum to teach people how to write because they feel we live in this technologically sophisticated age where it doesn't matter anymore. And if you look at black literature or white literature, but of course we're talking about us, black literature, you don't see the same great types of literature. Uh, you don't see that Ida B. Wells. You don't see that uh, Langston Hughes. You don't get that no more. Frederick Douglass. Okay, my ancestor. His narratives, his uh, three uh, books that he wrote on his life, that quality of literature, the W.E.B. Du Bois quality, you don't get it no more. Okay, part of that is the society. Part of it is us. And me personally, I think we need to have a renaissance in black literature. I think we need to go back to the basics. I think we need to bring that back up so we can get our children off of the TV and the radio and the internet. Because guess what? One of the reasons our children are struggling so much in school, they don't read anymore. When I was growing up, we had our fun through books. All I was was a bookworm. Me and my friends, after school, we would go to Temple University Library in North Philly, and we would sit there and just read all that. That was our entertainment. But there was no cell phones yet. There was no laptops yet. There was no 
tablets yet. You see, our kids have gotten away from that. So now what we have is a situation where black parents are buying their children electronic devices that do nothing but foster more academic failure. Your son spent 10 times playing video games, 10 hours playing video games. How many hours did he spend practicing his math? He was surfing the internet, probably looking at soft porn for five hours. <laughs> How many hours did he spend working on his writing skills? So parents, y'all need to check yourself because a lot of you are investing in your sons and daughters' future incarceration. Look at what you buy your kids. You got to ask, how is this helping my child? Except to have fun. It's not. And y'all need to cut that out. Where's the encyclopedia at in your house? Where's the dictionary? Where's the thesaurus? Is there a quiet hour in your home where the kids have to read for an hour every day? What are we doing to substantiate academic progress and intellectualism in our homes? Because if you're not, if you're not fostering self-education and love for knowledge in your children, then your house is nothing more than a slave factory. In America,